Hi, Ninja Nerds. In this video today, we're going to be talking about gout. So if you like this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and comment down below. Don't forget to subscribe and then check out ninjanerd.org. That's where we have all of our notes and illustrations for every lecture we put up here on YouTube. But let's get into talking about gout. So when we're talking about gout, we're going to be focusing mainly on that it's an inflammatory type of arthritis. And it's unique in its way that it's a crystal arthritis, meaning that we get a buildup of crystals that kind of get deposited into our joints. And we're going to talk about how that occurs. So within our body, we have something called uric acid. So right here, I have some uric acid crystals. And what happens is when we eat things that contain purines, so it's like seafood, alcohol, high fructose corn syrup, a couple other different types of things that when we eat, we get purines in our body. And purines then go through um, some changes and eventually we come to a product called uric acid. When we have a lot of uric acid, we can eventually get crystals. And when we have a lot of uric acid in the blood, we call that hyper uricemia, meaning a lot of uric acid in the blood. So when those levels are high, we get these crystals and they're not gonna get flushed out from our body through elimination of urine and they can actually get deposited into our joints. And when they get deposited into our joints, they'll be in things like our great toe or our big toe, they can be in our thumb, our knee, our ankle, and they'll get into these joints and create basically arthritis-like conditions. So they're gonna be inflammatory, it's gonna be red, it's gonna feel swollen, and it's gonna hurt with movement. And we call this gout. Now, why does this occur? We have some risk factors here. And some of these risk factors are causing either the production of uric acid to be really high or the elimination of uric acid to be low. So meaning our production is really high and our elimination is low. So we're, we're not having a complete output of this uric acid. So as it builds up and gets higher in our body, we have the hyperuricemia. So some of those risk factors can be things like cardiovascular disease, because there can be some medications that you're on with this. There can also be chronic kidney issues. And, or failure. And if you're using lots of diuretics, that can also cause some issues with gout. It can also be the type of diet that you're on. So if it's high in purines, like we talked about before, so those shellfish, alcohol, Obesity is another one. And there's also a genetic component as well. Okay. So these risk factors, if you're looking at this and you're trying to get an idea of what all this is encompassing, I just keep it in your mind as what I said before. It's just there's an increase of production and that's typically greater than the elimination or a decrease in elimination. So over time, that amount of uric acid is increasing, right? Okay, so we, now that we understand the risk factors, let's talk about what is the difference between primary and secondary gout. All right, engineers, so with primary gout, there is a difference, differential between primary and secondary. So primary gout is typically our most common type of gout. It is typically males, 40 to 50 year olds. And there is a component of genetics that also plays a role into this, as well as the increase in the purine diet or a cause of that increase in uric acid. And in contrast, this is just saying that the primary gout is just caused by something that directly is going to cause gout, where secondary gout is more so looking at secondary to some other disease process. So like we said up here before, it's something like maybe chronic kidney disease or that diuretic use. And we're talking excessive diuretic use where we're eliminating so much. We're also gonna be talking about anybody with any age. So if you have some type of risk factor that can put you into the secondary uh, gout group, then that could also cause you to have gout as well. 
So now that we've clarified basically what happens with the body and how gout can occur within the body, let's talk about what are our signs and symptoms that we're looking for, the labs that we're going to look at to diagnose differentially if this is gout or if it's some other type of arthritis, and then how we're going to treat gout for our patient. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of gout. And when we talk about this, we're also going to be focusing on that most arthritis has a very similar presentation until we start to narrow down some of those identifying lab work and then some other uh, tests that we can do. So first with the signs and symptoms, what we want to look at here is it's going to be that overall overarching same problem. So this patient's probably going to complain of pain, right? And that pain is going to be maybe in the gray toe, it can be in the thumb, it can be in the ankles, it can be in the knees. And it, it can be unilateral or it can be bilateral, but typically it's unilateral. And what we're looking at with that pain is because of what? We have the crystals depositing here, so there is some inflammation. And we know with inflammation and that swelling, there can be redness, right? So with that redness, we might also have some warmth at the joint. So this patient's got some pain, they've got some warmth, they've got some redness, inflammation. What else is something that they uh, typically complain about when they have gout? What's another symptom that these patients usually have? They usually say with the, painful, with the pain, it also feels like it's a little stiff because we want to think of that inflammation. Right. So we have the pain, we have the stiffness, we have all this, and then that pain can also be like tender. They can say, well, I went to put my sock on and oh, it really, really hurt. Or when I was going to do something, it really, really hurt my thumb. So we want to think about how all of this pain, inflammation, the redness, the warmth and the stiffness can all sound like any different type of arthritis, right? So when we're looking at this patient's either foot that they're having issues with. We can ask some other questions like, when did it start and everything, everything that can go along with uh, describing their pain. But eventually it's gonna come down to that lab work and the lab work is gonna indicate to us that, okay, this indeed sounds like gout. So when we're looking at the lab work that we're gonna run on these patients, the biggest one is gonna be that serum uric acid. So we're gonna check their blood and the serum uric acid is what? We talked about that this is hyperuricemia, so uric acid is going to be elevated, right? This is going to indicate to us that we have an elevated amount of uric acid, so that's a very good sign to us that this is probably gout. If it was low or normal range, then we would maybe look into some other tests. The next one is the BUN and creatinine. So remember when we're talking about the, uh, gout, we're also possibly looking at kidney function, and there's going to be an increase in these as well because there might be some issues with kidney function. And then we have the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which is our ESR, and this is a test that we run to see if there's any type of inflammation in the body. It's not specific to any type of gout, but it is nice to know, okay, there is elevated uric acid levels and there is an elevated ESR, so this indicates to us there's inflammation within the body. And then there's also the urinary uric acid. That is also elevated, because we are going to be trying to possibly push out all this uric acid. And remember, we have that problem with production versus elimination. So body is producing a lot of uric acid and it's trying to get it out, so those levels in the urine could be elevated as well. The doctor may also try to do any type of differential diagnoses by running some x-rays or imaging or anything else, but once we've narrowed down that this patient has gout, we are then going to move into our nursing interventions. And besides talking to our patient about any type of modifiers that we can do with our life, like trying not to eat as many types of foods that would have purines in them, like the shellfish and decreasing our alcohol consumption, also possibly trying to increase water so that we can help flush out the uric acid, we also wanted to start talking to our patients about medical adherence to medication. So patients that are going to be taking medications. And this typically is after a flare-up of two or three or the levels are really high and we want to start moving into helping our patients out using some medication. So one of the medications that a patient can get, uh, let's use purple, is colchicine. And colchicine is a medication that's going to help decrease the swelling within the joint and inflammation, along with our good old NSAIDs. If you remember what NSAIDs do, they help with inflammation as well. And that can be things like ibuprofen or indomethacin, 
which is one that's specifically an enzyme that's specifically used for gout. And these are also going to help with that inflammation, it's going to help with that pain, it's going to help with that little bit of redness as well. Then we have our corticosteroids, which can be our prednisone. We can also use that if the patient is having some other issues with maybe ibuprofen, not able to take ibuprofen, so we were going to give them maybe some corticosteroids very short term, hopefully get that gouty flare to come back down. Then we can move into medications that maybe these aren't working for our patients. They have extreme gout, gout that's going to be chronic. It's going on for a long time. It's really not reacting to colchicine, any type of NSAID or corticosteroid. We're going to look into the xanthine oxidase inhibitors. And basically what these do is that it inhibits xanthine oxidase. And what's xanthine oxidase? This is a medication that is going to help us take our xanthine that's within our body. So it's hypoxanthine to xanthine and then to our uric acid. So what this does is it stops that conversion of uric acid to be produced and therefore we will have less uric acid, which is great because that's our problem right now. So one of those xanthine oxidase inhibitors is allo Pure, purinol, oh, I'm spelling that wrong, purinol, purinol, there we go. So allopurinol is going to help us not make uric acid, essentially interrupt that process. And then it, the last that we're going to go on to is our uro, uricosuric medications, or ones that you would also know as an easier one, Losartan is one of them. Okay, and what this does is this helps decrease the reabsorption of uric acid, meaning once we have uric acid, it's only a one time, we're not gonna keep reabsorbing it within our body, so that way we can also keep those levels down. And overall, we wanna again, stress to our patient that we're looking for them to not only have this medical adherence to help decrease their gout, but also that low purine diet and then increasing water intake if they're allowed to with whatever disease process they might have within their body. But Essentially, that is gout, so I hope you got something from this lecture. I hope you liked it. Make sure you comment down below, and as always, until next time.